who visited the Fukushima prefecture in Japan to learn about the March 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster. We also learned how the region is recovering. We are here to share what we found with you. The Fukushima nuclear reactor was prepared for an earthquake, but not prepared for the subsequent tsunami to be as big as it was. And as a result, there was a meltdown. We spoke to one woman who gave us a very moving account of moving patients from a nursing home on the day of the disaster. In the, mor in the morning of March 11, I said goodbye to my family to go to the office. The federal government announced it to the inhabitants who live uh, five kilometers uh, and three miles away from the nuclear power plant, died to nuclear power plant, had to be evacuated. So at the moment, we have 120 people inside of the facility, and 60 of them uh, couldn't uh, were uh, like permanently sleeping on the bed, and. 40 people is, uh, can walk, but they have Alzheimer. So um, in our facility, most of the, uh, most of the person who lives in the uh, nurse, nursing house can move, cannot move. So uh, one of the, one of the uh, problem at the moment is how to uh, how to be evacuated with the people who cannot move, who cannot talk, and who has an Alzheimer. That is, the, uh, that is the most difficult problem at that moment. But we started to evacuate at 8, 8 a.m. in that morning, morning. So we put all elders in, and into the vehicles, uh, whichever they have, like for example, the ambulance, and then the vehicles who was owned by the workers, they used those vehicle, vehicle to evacuate. So after the disaster, she, she couldn't go back to her own house in, um, in Tomioka because uh, half of the town was destroyed by tsunamis. We de she decided to uh, demolish the house and uh, uh, since after the disaster, she ne she's, she cannot, she's never ever couldn't live in her house. Since people lost their homes, they were forced to live in temporary housing set up by the government. Some of this housing was difficult to get into. Before the disaster, survivors lived in wide open rural areas, but the temporary housing they moved into was cramped and small, and more like New York City apartments. The temporary housing ended up lasting seven years yeah, so. As you can see here, like these houses are pretty close together and Keiko was telling me, right, like when they used to live there, the they could hear their next door neighbor and everything. And some of you are from New York, right? Like from mm, yeah. you you live right next to your neighbor, you can hear them, you're used to it. But imagine being somebody who lived in the countryside, had their own home, their nearest neighbor was probably twenty five how long how many minute walk? Like my neighbor was at like almost a mile away yeah like a More mile, than a mile away. away so like a 25 neighbor. minute walk to your next door neighbor and you live in you know yes. your own land and everything can you imagine what kind of shift that is how how stressful that can be to like now have to live in such a cramped space and stuff like that like all of that is just something that a lot of people have to suffer through and deal with my my family is from okuma but we are living in we were lived like those kind of complex temporary housing and I remember that uh, many volunteering groups come up to the community space and try to help us and give us support us like for like for example ledger regulation physical exercise and mental like helps mental health care and something like that but now it's gone everything is gone because it's been more than seven years now and so since all those supports from volunteering group had had stopped, uh, now the local government is the main supporter who is trying to contact with the citizens and try to help them. And I, like few few days ago, actually one of the lady uh, from the uh, from the local government visited my my her, my apartment, and she asked me like if everything is okay, if your mental health is okay. And now the 
local government is doing all those kind of supports and cares. And so even though when it happened originally, they had volunteering groups to provide like you know activities like that because it's been so long since it happened. Um, you know, even though the people that live here in these like residential areas, they still have the pain. They still struggle every day with it. But for everybody else, it's been seven years, so the pain for them is not as direct. So they, I don't want to say that they lose interest or something, but their priorities change to something more immediate. However, unfortunately, the people that are here still struggling are left behind. And, you know, it's something that the, the residents of the evacuation zone are kind of being forgotten or left behind. We were able to go inside the exclusion zone, where we saw buildings that were a time capsule of how they were in 2011. It will be bad enough if the people affected by the disasters just lost their homes, but they also had to deal with the discrimination after 3-11. I saw the documentary about the guy who was experienced two bombing, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Only one guy expo experienced those two bombing stuff. And now he's 90 years old. He was, he wanted to tell this story. People was suffered from the discrimination of, like you guys are contaminated. And you, I don't want to give a birth with this woman, something like that. So even 90 years old guy, he's still carrying the pain inside of himself. I don't know how long it's gonna take for my... Even though we're global kids, we can always make comparisons to our own homes and communities in New York and the U.S. Just like the 311 nuclear disaster affected the people and economy of Fukushima, there are nuclear reactors in America that harm local communities. Before going to Japan, we met with an organization here in New York that fights for environmental justice. We learned that there are many negative side effects of nuclear energy. In January 2017, the Hudson River Keeper, the New York State, and the owners of Indian Point Nuclear Power Station Energy signed a landmark agreement to close the center by 2021. And under this agreement, the two aging nuclear reactors at Indian Point will shut down. We now have another waterkeeper organization in Miami, Florida, fighting the Turkey Point nuclear power plant. Turkey Point power plant is leaking um, radioactive wastewater into the drinking water source for Miami and South Florida. The other issue um, around Turkey Point and the community is that a lot of community members around this area are low income and we have a huge issue about environmental justice. What happens is that people who do not have the resources to fight big industry are the first to suffer. Government and TEPCO organization itself disrespect our land. They took advantage of our land. And they took advantage of our people, people ourselves. The TEPCO and the federal government spelled the myth of safety of the nuclear power plant. So we believed it. I, th I thought it I could go back to my house after a week, so I've just packed three day, uh, packed the old luggage into my small backpack for three days, all clothes, a uh, little bit important stuff inside of my bag, and I all everything I left behind of my house. And after that day, it's been seven years, more than seven years. Uh, the most shocking scene I've ever ha seen was the explosion on the TV. The government didn't announce it, just I saw it on the TV. Broadcasting company was faster than the government announcement. That was kind of ridiculous. So I still feel really angry, you know. We visited a museum dedicated to the history of coal power in Fukushima 
and why the area became so dependent on nuclear energy in the first place. As you could see, there was a mining point in Tomioka, but Tomioka didn't have any other industry, so they had to accept the nuclear power plant to build. I think it is difficult to change into the nuclear power plant into the alternative energy quickly because entire the region which has a nuclear power plant is rely on only rely on the nuclear industry. So it is quite difficult to change in change immediately, but we hope in the future we can we can declining the amount of the nuclear power plant time, step by step and in the future I, there is no any nuclear power plant in entire of Japan. We're happy to report that throughout Fukushima we saw many solar power panels so the region is on a more sustainable path forward. The 311 disaster is still fresh in the minds of everyone in Fukushima. People acknowledge that there is a long road to recovery. People also have hope for the future. Before the disaster, Tomiyaka had a population of 20,000. Now it's only about 660. But Tucson is trying to change all that. So uh, there's a lot of people who was coming to, for example, uh, Iwate Prefecture, Miyagi Prefecture, and Fukushima, Iwaki City in Fukushima Prefecture. But since this uh, this town, Tomioka, was inside of the exclusion zone. Nobody was coming. Not only the Tomioka, but also whole Futaba region. Nobody was coming to do volunteering, of course, and nobody is not is not living was not living in there. So I decided to build a volunteering organization by myself to help the town. I'm trying to. Uh, gather the old people time by time, and I'm still on the on the on. Uh, I'm still doing to get, uh, to build the to build a new community again. There is no easy solution to the environmental abuse, either here in America or in Fukushima. But as the next generation of leaders taking this trip open our eyes to global issues that are very important. As Global Kids, we are dedicated to taking a stand for environmental justice. The movement now has allies all over the world.